And let me get to it. Um, so these are two separate uh, topics, uh, quantum circuit size overbound of the UV. And uh, I construct a couple of perfect tensors. Um, the first uh, work is done jointly by Harry Berman uh, in this new introduction. He is at CWI in Amsterdam. And he has recently founded a little institute inside CWI called QSoft. Um, and it joined with my research assistant, Tomasz Liskos. So first, because it's a mixed audience, and that's why this conference is so great, um, let me give a little um, introduction to classical circuit complexity. Because like there are, um, there are a couple of bits of information I want to say, not much. Um, so, uh, computer scientists look at two kinds of circuits mostly. Uh, the first kind is like general kind of circuit where like you have every gate has two inputs, but these are orbitally connected and you can go as high as you want. The other kind of circuit is bounded depth circuits. So of course when the depth is bounded, like let's say you have 10 levels or two levels, well, the fan in two just does not make sense because then you wouldn't be able to collect information in depth two or depth ten, right? So you need unbounded fan. So these are the two big types of circuits. Now, the subtypes, well, now let's talk about the gates. And the gates can be, well, either and or a negation, which is usually you know, but it, they could also be arbitrary, uh, like two input, one output Boolean functions in the case of general circuits. And so here are the, the circuits studied in the bounded depth model, well, unbounded fanning and or, and well, it's just fanning one negation, and, or you can add modulo two gates, or you can add modulo six gates. Now, what is about six? Well, six is not prime. So two is a prime. So actually, I could have written now. mod three, uh, and here I could have written anything mod 15. So, or threshold gates. Now, sort of these are, in this order, uh, this is how the circuits become increasingly clever. And you know how clever neural nets are, which are basically threshold circuits. So these so threshold gates are just super clever. And of course, no bounded depth circuit can be as clever as, as unbounded depth circuits. So unbounded depth circuits are really super, super clever. Uh, but the bad news is that sort of inversely proportional to how clever a circuit is, you can give lower bounds to um, like circuit complexity. So here is the state of the art. Um, that as a matter of fact, we don't have, and actually if you, if you read like an article, they will say that that's like the miserable state or embarrassing, whatever, uh, to, or, uh, to the entire computer science that we cannot give any better lower bound for like general circuits with and or and negation gates than 5N. And just recently, and that was a major what, what conference. Are these, what are these bands on? What are these bands on? Okay, so thank you. So <laughs> the, the bounds on um, are, okay, so, the, so actually there are two types of functions for which we want bounds. So, um, so either I give you some explicit function, and so for this 5n is for some, somewhat diabolic but explicit function, like let's say the, but let, let me just say the inner product mod 2 function, or some explicit function you understand. Uh, and it's not to be confused with some general random function for which we do have lower bounds. 
And actually, thanks for this question, because this distinction is very important. That when I say we don't have lower bounds, it means we don't have lower bounds for explicit functions. Can you say what explicit means? I mean, I well, explicit, OK, think of it as polynomial time computable right. functions. Right. With like, a broader notion of explicit, we would have better bounds. Like yeah. Yeah, 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 but this, this, yeah. You know, I don't like that. Okay. Because Fine. that's not Fine. that explicit. So okay. there, there are Fine. degrees Fine. to Fine. explicit. Fine. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So the MX, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so over general, whatever, gates, the, well, of course, the situation has to be worse, right? Because whatever lower bound works for general gates, that also works for and or and negation gates. And so there, uh, that was a stock paper, I think. Uh, so it, for 30 years, it was 3. And now it was improved to 3 plus 1 over 6, 86 or something. And that was a major conference paper. OK, so, um, so bounded depths, we have now much better bounds. And for like really stupid device like just bound bounded Fanning and organ but 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 bounded depths, we have exponential lower bounds. However, already with mode six gates, and that's where our art stops, we already don't have bounds at all, and of course neither for threshold circuits. So this is where we might be able so that would be the next step. That would be guaranteed like an exponential bound would be guaranteed to be like a, a top paper in any major computer science conference. Where did six come from? What about mod five? No, mod five is five is prime. Six comes from that. It was that that is six is not a prime. So and, mod six is not a prime power. Either. And not a prime power. So, yeah, thank you. Scott. So it's not even a prime power. So, so for nine, so what for if more yeah. yeah. nine it would be still uh, we would have bound. Um, okay, so but why like why um, do we have only socks that with bounded depths? And I have already told you that so so um well no, no, so no, no, no. So actually, the other circuits are just too smart. Like, um, because all our bounds, all our lower bounds, are kind of coming from, like, here is a quantity. Like, we want to estimate, like, so C, F would be just the circuit complexity of F. And, but we want like, but but that we don't know how to estimate or count. So we we try to find some estimator to this such that this is less or equal than the circuit complexity which we can bound. Like so, that's the bound we can actually compute or calculate. But, but this kind of bonds are kind of, like, it could come from you guys, like from physicists, right? Sorry. And that's what you mean by success? Yeah, so success, I guess, I mean that we cannot, that, that we bond it for bonded depths, we can prove lower bonds, and for, for the other types of circuits, we can't. So, so all these lower bonds measure progress as we build bigger and bigger gates and see do we compute so so how does the circuit like as we build like get closer to our function so this progress is measured in terms of like kind of physics quantities like entropy or something but but we, we don't have this this estimator that could measure like these really devious reasons why you know, a circuit may be, may be 
I mean, by, by function, maybe hard. Um, as a matter of fact, there is a theorem which tells that we might never be able to, because there is the theorem of Rasborough and Rudich, which says that, as a matter of fact, we are never gonna prove non poly or super polynomial lower bounds uh, by the means of natural proofs. And what are natural proofs? Well, natural proofs are with natural estimators. So what is a natural estimator? Well, it's kind of an L, which is like, so LF is an estimator which looks at the truth table of F and in polynomial time, in terms of the size of the truth table, actually can be, uh, so it's a polynomial time, L is a polynomial time function in terms of the truth table of F. So this, so it, so it's this kind of estimator is a natural proof, and um, and simply if let's say one way function exists, but really one is just red herring. So what really it is is that if we can have pseudo random generators for that circuit class, then. Um, we will never be able to show like with lower bounds. So sort of we have, so this is our knowledge horizon, like we just simply never, we just never get beyond that. Like there is no way, like sort of we feel we, that that's, that's, we will never like get out of that. Okay, so, yes. Well, you know, there are, I mean, like you can look at the degree, I don't want to get into that, so here maybe I'm lying a little bit, but like if you look at like polynomial degree and these kind of things, these are, I can argue, these also belong to kind of, they are also natural. So, um, okay, so, so the, 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 um, this first part of the talk was just, just a sort of to sell you why you should be happy with this very, very big lower bound uh, <laughs> that I, I have with Hari, uh, which is, let's say, a 1.2n lower bound for some um, function. And I will tell you what the function is uh, for quantum theory. Because, you know, these 3N, 5N, these are for classical circuits. So, um, the proof method is not going to be a breakthrough. It's, as usual, it's by information bottleneck argument. So, business as usual, right? Or business may be the only kind of business what is possible, at least to our current knowledge. Um, and so here, let me again give you a little introduction to something which maybe many of you know, but let me just repeat. So, uh, so quantum communication complexity uh, is well, how many bits Alice and Bob have to exchange in order to compute a function where, like Alice has the part of the input, the axis, and Bob has part of the input, the y's, and Alice can do any computation, but only that involves axis, and, and similarly Bob with y's, and then they can just send bits to each other, sort of connect their computations, and the question <coughs> is how many bits do they need to exchange, and of course it depends on how this function sort of intertwines x's and y's. So how it depends on both x's and y's in some intertwined way. And um, so the inner product function is just simply um, just the inner product modulo 2 that you know of, and the lower bounds that uh, Kramer and later Cleve, Wim van Damme, Nielsen, and Tech 
obtained was n over 2, basically for the error-free error case, and n over 2 a little bit less when there is epsilon error. And with prior entanglement, but let's forget about it. We don't need that. So let me remind you their proof, which is, I think it's a beautiful proof. And so that's the proof of the later set of orders. So this picture shows you the proof, the lower bound proof. Um, that modulo to inner product needs a lot of communication. So let's assume that you have a circuit where, like a circuit has an Alice side and the Bob side, and they exchange only a few uh, bits of information, and in the end, Bob outputs the inner product. So I am turning this circuit into another circuit, which is almost the same as the original circuit, but it does something else. So what it's going to do is that, um, is that uh, again, all this gets x, Bob gets y, and in the end, actually Bob is able to output x. So the only change that I have to do for this circuit is just to apply on each x size, on each y i's, and actually the output wire, which I forgot, the other mar, and then in the end I have to also apply the other mars. And lo and behold, I mean that's in the end, like if you look at these wires, you just get the x on them. Now, is it possible? Well, of course it's possible, but because of the level bound, the only way to get this information about x to here is if there is the amount of information that goes through this, I mean, this line is order of, as a matter of fact, it's n quantum bits. Now, you might ask where the n over 2 comes from, and that's because I did not tell you, but you have to assume that this is a clean circuit, meaning that the output, so you restore the zeros on the ancillas, but with a loss of two, you can actually assume, so from every circuit, you can, you can um, just uh, create, so there is a yet another circuit which is not clean, and just by, uh, by Increasing the amount of communication by two, you get here by a factor of two, and then from here you get here, here, and it's in, and so that, and so this part implies that there has to be a lot of connections. Okay, so now the next two slides will show our proof. I think it's two slides. Okay, so. So this is the motivation for our proof. And um, just don't beat, beat me up, because it's going to be a very simple proof. So, uh, so, uh, so let's assume that your circuit has like n instead of 1.2 times n, it has just n plus a little uh, number of gates. So it means that your circuit is almost a tree. So if it's almost a tree, well, you can cut it into half in such a way that, that through the cut, there is only small amount of information going through. Um, now, um, well, if you knew, so I did not tell you what the function was, but if I told you and you found that between these inputs and these inputs, you would need like a large amount of communication to compute the function, then you would know that such a cut is not possible. Therefore, it's not possible that your circuit looks like this. And so this is the proof idea, but all what I, OK, it was three slides. Because here I tell you so the two problems, which I would say technical, are technical details that um, so the first problem is that when, um, 
So I showed you that cut in the tree, but really that how this tree looks where the enemy designs sort of this entire circuit. And your task is to prove that however, whatever circuit the enemy designs, it cannot solve your problem. So if your communication uh, problem between this set of inputs and this set of inputs, then of course the enemy will not put the, uh, I mean the, this set of input to this side of the tree and this set of inputs to this side, but rather it would mix the two. So really what you need is the function should have the property not only that it has large communication complexity between two fixed parts, but that for any two parts, it would have large communication complexity. And so the other thing what you need is that, well, you know, it's a, the circuit that the enemy uh, created is a tree-like thing, but the tree can be any funny shape, but you want to show that any funny shape tree can be cut into two, but that's well known. Right? It's not even, I, I, I don't even need this. It's well known. So this is the last slide for the proof, so this is the function. This is the function. Take an expander graph, and um, and so the and so your function is that. So this is mod two. I'm sorry. This is mod two. So x i x j are bits. So take a fixed expander graph, like it could come from the, the zigzag construction of Avi or web or whichever uh, uh, fixed explicit expander graph like which has an easy simple description and just and just define your function as this formula and um, now if the enemy puts these labels like Bob 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 anywhere or Alice 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 anywhere to your variables then because it's an expander graph there is a large cut and you can embed the inner product into your function. And so this function has the property that for an arbitrary chosen balanced cut, you have large communication complexity. End of proof. OK, so now let me just um, well a little bit more on Sorry, this. Maybe it was considered was before. It, uh, I, it. I think it was, frankly. I so I don't think we have invented the wheel or anything. We, you know, we just had fun <laughs> at the blackboard. Uh, but I want to. I wanted to. So that's actually that's my memory is when I was still hoping to find like nonlinear circuit lower bounds, and there was this idea. I think of Valiant because the situation is so desperate that, <laughs> that we don't even have circuit lower bounds for when actually you have like n inputs and n outputs. Like let's say in matrix multiplication, for instance, you have like two n square inputs and n square outputs. So Valiant, or but maybe it wasn't him, has constructed a function such which has the property that every Boolean circuit that computes the function must have the property that so the circuit is a network and in this network it must obey the property that no matter how the enemy tells you a permutation between the inputs and I mean in a matching between the inputs and outputs there has to be a vertex disjoint um, a vertex is joined route. So the hope was that the um, there has to be a what? Sorry, vertex, a vertex yeah, is joined route. So so you tell me the permutation and the network must have the property that there ought to exist a routing like this uh, for every permutation. And so the hope was that that any 
assert uh, that any network with this property must have super polynomial number of, of vertices, like inner vertices. You mean, you mean super linear? So I mean no. super linear. Yeah. I'm well, sorry, super linear. Yeah, 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 super linear. Yeah. So that would give you a super linear circuit board. However, Basalido completely destroyed these hopes by giving a graph which has linear number of nodes and has this property. So that was sort of the, I think, the end of the hope that you can find, that you can do anything with the information bottleneck arguments. Um, so, but, okay, so we don't have just the geometry of the network, but we also have the gates. So I was looking a little bit that what happens if you actually cut the gates and not the and not the wires? Because wires, well, they actually they forward like one bit of information, but if you look at sideways, so here is what this is what I mean, that so well if I cut it this way then that's three bits of information. But maybe this gates are not interacting too well in sideways, so I, at least I could improve on the constants. And so this is what, how I went about it, that I can define what it means that like how much information goes from, let's say, from these three legs to these three legs sideways, and it is just computing the entanglement entropy, so I'm just looking at um, like as a six leg tensor, and if I am yeah, now interpreting it as a quantum state, what is the entanglement entropy through this cut? And I have computed the, and I have to normalize, actually, it should be square root of eight, by the way. Um, but so if I, I have computed it for the Toffoli gates and the Fredkin gates. And so the side way, sort of the entanglement entropy is, um, well, these are the numbers. And actually, there is one missing for each, because it should be like one side contains the 0, and so you can have 5 choose 2 of the other one. So that should be 10 numbers, and I have 9 for some reason. Uh, but, but, these, but so I think here at 3 is missing, and here I don't know what exactly missing, but this is the sideways entropies of these gates. And so the hope is that this was my hope, and it almost gave me the heart attack yesterday, that, uh, and actually maybe I, I, sh I should have gotten it, because it's still, it's still not resolved, that I just simply thought that if I sort of cut that circuit into two parts, that the total entropy that can go from this part to this part is upper bounded by the sums of these sideways entropies. And I just couldn't prove that. And I asked a couple of people, and they said that, no, maybe it's not true even. But, but they did not give me any counterexample. So you know, you never say never, so maybe it's true. Okay, so this was my last slide, and now I'm just, I'm just going to the second part of the talk, which is construction of perfect tensors. By the way, all time favorite paper, um, what is this? That's not what I meant. That's a great paper too, but that's not related. Um, this one. Um, so this paper um, uh, by Potowski, Yoshida, Harlow, and Preskill introduces um, uh, perfect tensors. <coughs> so what are they? Uh, no more space on the board. Yeah, maybe we should just... Um, can we also get rid of the light, maybe? John, do you want to... Okay, 
so you have a tensor, and let's assume that the dimensions are not like, so these are not qubits, but rather like the dimension is like, let's say, d, 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 d. Okay, so let me talk about six legs, but in general, I have like two and legs, and the idea is that no matter how I group the legs into n and n, like three and three, if I look at it this way, that's, so what does it mean? It means that like I have this tensor, and let's say I, J, K, L, M, N, so it's like T, I, J, K, L, M, N, and so in Python, it's just called reshaping the tensor or whatever. So I'm reshaping it. That, so I, 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 I view it as a matrix, right? So I view it as like T. Um, and then so I group these t three together. So J, K, and L. And, and here, like I, M, and N. Right, so this, uh, so I'm clumping this together. So then this would be a matrix, right, with two legs, and so this would be like d to the cube, and d to the cube, and so no matter how I do this grouping, this matrix must be unitary. So for every for every base of choosing three, I mean separating six in this way. Um, and so now I am actually constructing two types of tensors, and let me just uh, uh, hope. Okay, so. So the first type of tensor is what I would just call permutation tensor. So permutation tensor is nothing, but like so that the, the, your tensor is kind of like a, a cube or something. And like let's assume that so, and for instance, like if I just put like ones in the, ones in the diagonal, or in such, uh, no, 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 no. I, I'm sorry, no, that's not, that's not what I want to say. So if I, I'm sorry, I, actually not this stupid, sorry. So I, I flatten out the tensor like this. So sort of I make anyhow a matrix out of my tensor. And so if I see just the permutation matrix, so if I just apply this reshaping, and I see a permutation matrix. Um, and so in all different ways, then, it's a, then I call it a permutation tensor. So my first effort goes into constructing permutation tensors. The second is just a remark. So remark that once I have a permutation tensor, I can create what I would call a diffusion tensor or Grover tensor just by, you know, replacing the ones with, I think, 1 over like 2 and whatever, you know, so this is, okay, so now it's not n, so 2 times like d, d cubed, right, so n is here now d cubed and the zeros by, oh, uh, what, what is it? So whatever the Grover matrix, uh, whatever, okay, what, what are the Grover matrix? Uh, you see, so when you have, like, let's say the ones, then you can do it like one over one or minus two n, right? Something uh -huh. like that. One over three. Sorry? The entire matrix is one over two n. 
well, so everything is 1 over 2n, but then in the diagonal you have what? Minus 1. Minus 1. Minus 1. Okay, so then you replace the 1s by minus 1s and the zeros by, by 1 over 2n. <coughs> right? So if you start from a permutation tensor, And then you can get a diffusion tensor just by doing these replacements. That, that's quite clear because simply when you flatten out your tensor, right, then instead of this matrix, now you get the Grover matrix, well, except that the permuted version of the Grover matrix, but it's still unitary. So you still get a unitary operator. So you have this. So if you get one by one, get one free or whatever. So, um, so let's focus on the permutation tensors. So notice that, um, like in that my favorite paper, right, the holographic quantum error correcting codes, um, um, like actually there is a code which. So, I, so, I, so I, okay. So there, like it's apparently we are now talking about a, a two two, and so the b is three, and so I claim this that if I have an error, there's just a completely classical error correcting code, which is like so. This is so this code is an element of. Of um, an error correcting code over you know the three or the alphabet so it is just a code and so now I interpret these as um, so so the so the ones so where are the ones where the ones has to be like M I J K L is one if I J K L is in the code and zero otherwise. Because notice that here that when I flatten things out in the case of D equals three and four legs, the number of ones all together, so this is gonna be a nine by nine matrix. So the number of ones all that has to be like nine, and these are the nine positions where you have ones. Now notice that this code has the property <coughs> that every two code words have at least distance three from each other, if I am not mistaken. Now, if you have this property, then it's not possible that so but what would really devastate you is that Let's say you have here 0, 0, and you had a 1 here, let's say at, at 0, 1, and let's say at 2, 1, or mm -hmm. something. Right? But that would mean that you would have two code words, like 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 0, 2, 1, which would have distance 2 from each other. But this code has a property that it has distance 3, therefore, so actually, so you can always, so the first construction is that when simply find, so, so here now this, so we are here now, so, so there are two constructions I wanted to, so, so the first construction is find a classical, 
code with distance greater or equal than n with minimal distance and plus 1. And we cover that the length of the code is 2n. It's not n, right? So here the n was 2. In, the, in this case, the m was 2. And in this case, the m is 3. OK, so the other, very quickly, OK, so this is my other construction, and I am done. So the other construction Sorry, is that minimum distance n plus 1, right? Is greater or equal than n plus 1. Thank you very much. So the other construction is that, actually notice that what I need, like when I flatten it out, so what are the dimensions of this matrix? Well, this matrix is going to be um, a 2 to the, I'm sorry, a, a d to the n by d to the n matrix. So what I need in my code is to find d to the n, d to the n code words. So actually, I should have said that that d to the n code words. So here in the second construction, I also need d to the n code words. But now, actually, let n, uh, or actually let d be a prime. So let's assume d is a prime. And let's look for, um, let's look for a code which is a linear code. So it's a subspace over d. For instance, let's assume now that n, that so now just construction by example, and really that's my last thing to say, that, so now let's assume that n equals 7. So d, so I chose n to be great, uh, so I'm sorry, so d equals 7, and I chose d to be greater than 2d. And so let's assume here that d equals 3. So we are now trying to construct something where like each dimension is 7. And here is my construction. Mario, what did you mean by d greater than 2d? Uh, <laughs> I mean uh, d equal to n. d equal d greater than 2n. Right? So here n equals 3. I'm sorry, but did I write? Right, so then n equals 3. OK. And so then what I'm going to do is, so again, I have to describe you the places where the ones are. Right? So where are the ones? Well, it will be 6 to poles such that each element of 6 to pole is um, like a number modulo 7. And here is what they are that I have, like 1, 6, 2, 4 is just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. The other 6, 2, 4 is like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. A third 6, 2, 4 is 1, 4, 2. So 2 is the 7 squared. So everything you should, I mean, so 3 squared. 4 squared, so everything is mod 7, 5 squared, 6 squared. And so this is it. And take all linear combinations of these. So just take, so basically all my 6 to poles are just 8 times this plus b times this plus c times this. And simply because of the properties of the van der Mond matrix, it's going to be true that like if I am fixing, like I am saying that let's say in my matrix, like I'm fixing a row, meaning like fixing the first, let's say the first three coordinates, and I'm asking, do I find a unique uh, a unique second three triplet for the second three coordinates 
such that um, they are in this set? And the answer is yes, because I just view the problem as a linear equation over, well, over GF7, and then I just solve it, and then it gives me the unique, so once you say the first three should be like two, zero, let's say six, then you can just plug it in, you can solve it for A, B, C, and there is gonna be a unique A, B, C, which gives you the second. Thank you very much. If you would say like a unitary matrix is a permutation matrix, then you would not get terribly excited about that. Yet in the case of tensors, somehow we are still happy about it. So I don't know why are we happy about it, but uh, but we are happy about it. Uh, but I I did not. So that's why I created the diffusion tensor because that looks more quantumy, but I don't know if we should if we should be happy about like any of these because like none of them because you know these these permutations are kind of you know why would nature create exactly those permutations? Yes. They do correspond to classical. They do per, they could do correspond to classical permutations, right? That's so for every flattening, actually, you get some kind of classical permutation. So, so one thing that was annoying about the perfect tensors that we found is that they they didn't really have full symmetry. So do you know if it's possible to construct perfect tensors which have complete permutation symmetry of the indices? So is it? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I don't know of any examples. I don't know if anyone else does. Uh, yeah, so maybe it's not possible. Well, yeah, lack of example is not a perfect possible. Why, why was it important? Well, it, it, because the, um, the symmetry of the code is less than the symmetry of the graph in our example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the, you know, the tensor is going to yeah. have deferred orientation. So if you, I don't know, if you're interested in preserving, you know, having a, their, a largest, as large of a subgroup of the conformal group yeah, as you can. Okay. I understand. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's thank Mario again.